that sort of commemorates Kafka from several parts of his life. And uh, well, very glad to welcome Christopher here again. So he was here with us at Free Market Roadshow last year. And uh, just a really remarkable person, as you might have already noticed. <laughs> so give a warm welcome to Christopher. Thank you. Wow. I was, I'm from Georgia, Atlanta. So when I visited what was then known as the Soviet Union, one of the places I wanted to come to was Georgia. So I came before not all of you, but before some of you were born in 1982. I came to Tbilisi for a couple of days to look around and see the old capital and the wonderful churches and, and the, the sites at that time. So I've always had an affection for this country, an interest, and then I developed an affection. It didn't catch the first time quite, because things were quite different at that time. And, um, but since uh, 2004, I probably have come every other year, roughly, if not. Uh, so it's wonderful for me to be here. So I'm, I'm very happy to, to meet all of you. Uh, especially the young people, well, particularly the young people here. How many of you are more free today than your parents were? If you didn't raise your hand, you didn't understand the question, or you have a different view of the world. How many of you believe that the conditions of life are better today than they were? How many of you believe that the conditions of life will be better in the future than they are now. Well, then I don't need to give this lecture. You probably will agree with me that I think we have great reason to be optimistic about our future. But it requires one essential ingredient, and that is human liberty. The reason you're better off today than your parents or your grandparents is because you're more free. And what that freedom means is that you're able to engage in lots of new types of activities. Experimenting with cultural expressions, I saw some wonderful statues downstairs, the art in the foyer there, created by one of your fellow students. I mean, these kind of expressions were probably much more difficult during your parents' and grandparents' time. The other thing, in walking around the, what I would say would be the old part of the city, I don't know if I'm, there may be, I know there's multiple parts and different sides of the river and so on, but where I was walking today, I, I realized, I said, my God, this country, through trade, created so much wealth at some time that was suppressed and ver almost destroyed by a crazy experiment that your country suffered under for such a long time. And now that to see it reviving, is, it's just amazing. But I, it, it's a tribute to the destructive effect of communism that a productive people like the people that created all this wealth, that this could be suppressed. I mean, it's just extraordinary. In other words, you had to attack at the heart of human nature to take away that sort of capacity for people to problem solve, to create wealth, to improve their life, and to keep people in a state of sort of fixed misery for such a long period of time. It's, it's, it's really striking. So this is why when I talk about, in particular, the environment, I'm deeply concerned about how we react to our concerns about the environment in terms of reducing or expanding human liberty. Because that, to me, is what life is about. We, we cannot live a meaningful life, I don't believe, unless we're free. But we all have to be free, of course. I mean, my freedom should not be more privileged than your freedom, so that we all are viewed as equally valuable human beings and respected as a consequence. Okay, so if you have any questions, my email 
is up there if, um, if you wanted to, to copy that. I'll be happy to let you copy or have the, these particular slides. So let's look at what's going on. Well, there's no question. Concern for the environment is something we all need to be engaging in. So there's, we don't have any kind of question there. But what I'm going to suggest to you, I create this idea of a natural environment where nature exists on its own with or without humans, and the human environment, that is where humans act and interact among themselves. So that I don't see that we should privilege this natural environment to the extent that it suppresses the human environment, the place where we all bleed the place where we all engage one another. So this is where this whole discussion will go. Now, so that means that we have to debate or discuss or d discover how we can best try to make the natural environment the best we can have while protecting at the same time, time the natural environment of humanity. Okay? So this is what I'm trying to get you to think about. Now, so there's two basic ideas here. Regulating human actions comes in two flavors. Not chocolate and vanilla. That was meant to be a joke. It didn't work. But um, uh, the first one is government control. Now, government regulation is imposed. The other flavor is what we would call voluntary or self-regulation that takes place in the private sector. Okay? Now, it's, it's organic, in other words. These are things that evolve. We regulate ourselves based upon our sort of evolutionary exchanges with one another. So what we see is that with government regulation, and this is the one that we're, most people are most familiar with. If you use the term regulation, most people think of government regulation or government interventions or legislative requirements. Uh, it's an elite group, perhaps elected politicians, could be technocrats, bureaucrats. Then they decide what everyone must do based upon either politics or ideology. And you say, but well, it could be science. Well, science is something that is constantly contested. That's the nature of science. There is no single scientific answer that won't be challenged some point in the future. Whether we talk about medicine, uh, there's some aspects of physics that are constantly being tested uh, in terms of the physical world. Every aspect of science if it is a true science, is going to be fluid, dynamic, and subject to question. Now, the voluntary self-regulation is decentralized human action. So, human control. That is, each of us is inputting here, as opposed to government regulation, where one group or one individual decides for all of us, whereas in the voluntary arrangement, we're all engaged in this process. And I'll give you some examples of this, but the point is that we are choosing our lives and how we live them. The government imposed rules rely on force. Every government has a monopoly on the legal use of violence. And ultimately, every regulation has as a potential outcome in the extreme of death of who would violate it. So if you violate a, an environmental code, if you resisted and fought back against it, maybe physically refused to be arrested, they could kill you in the limit. And it would be acceptable in the sense. It would be regrettable maybe within the context. But the state has that right in a sense to kill us in the end. I mean, I'm taking it to the extreme. Well, I'll give you an example. It was, a, it was a black man in New York City that was selling cigarettes one by one. And there was a regular tax on tobacco 
in New York City, which made buying a packet of cigarettes extremely expensive. So most poor people couldn't afford to buy a packet of cigarettes. So he was making money selling one cigarette at a time. The police came to arrest him. He resisted and they killed him. Was it worth that? Do we want to regulate people's behavior so much that we are willing to kill people for selling a cigarette? I mean, this is crazy. But this is the potentiality. It's an exaggeration somewhat, but it's a potentiality we have to think about. So the, the voluntary rules are chosen by those who are affected by them. Now, we'll see in a moment that this is a much better arrangement where it is possible. Okay, where it is possible. Okay, now, in examining this idea of how we reach our objective of trying to maintain simultaneously the natural environment and the human environment, we have to realize that there are trade-offs. The more the state regulates the human environment, I mean, natural environment, the more they will restrict our private, individual, voluntary choices. We need to keep that very firmly in mind. This, this, I mean, I lost it, but I don't know. Uh, you can probably hear me without it, unless there's a big... So, let's look at me. Ah, well, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't like these contraptions. Obviously, I'm not very good at it. I like, I like being able to just talk to people. Uh, so, what we see then, well, look at how the state is involved in regulation. Now, and there are many environmentalists that blame capitalism and private property ownership as the basis of the problems with the environment. So, air, water pollution or air pollution, so we need to see, uh, I think that's mine. <laughs> so we need to see how this works. Now, it turns out the reality, what, back in the 1990s, when I was traveling around East and Central Europe, I was shocked at the, the, the terrible environmental condition where the state-owned factories polluted the rivers and the overall environment to a, an amazing degree. And I was thinking, the state is supposed to be protecting its citizens, but the state-owned enterprises were poisoning their own people. The same when I was a professor in China in the 1980s. I went to China. There was a river next to my university that was the color of this, this chair. It was black. You could almost walk on it. State-owned factories were polluting it. She's trying to make me do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. Here we go. So, uh, so wherever you see these kind of arrangements, that's where you see the real environmental disasters. There was a book called Ecocide, and it was a description of these uh, centrally planned economies and how they destroyed the ecology. It... it it's extraordinary that people don't have a sense about this. But, of course, I saw it firsthand, and I had a, a, a way of interpreting the world as I saw it, which made it very clear to me that the fundamental problem was the state control and ownership of all the resources. So this echo side I mentioned, it wasn't only in the Soviet Union, but it was also in China and all the centrally planned economies that, I've, that I ever visited. Some were better than others, some were worse than others. But in general, and what we were seeing in the West was gradual improvements in environmental conditions. If you went to London at the beginning of the 20th century, London was a mess. The air was polluted by coal uh, from the uh, furnaces to keep people warm. The horses 
were doing terrible things in the street. Environmental problems. But what happened? Oil was introduced. Electricity was introduced. Cars came. All these old problems began to disappear. And the market actually cleaned up the environmental problems over time. So, uh, the other thing is that the great, great experiments with socialism was really social engineering. Central planning, of course, but also creating a new man. Right? This was the grand scheme. So that people would be selfless, they would sacrifice themselves to the community, to the state, or to the plan. Right? That was the whole idea. But there's no purity, either ideologically nor politically, when you get into social engineering. Because it's my idea about how your behavior should be changed. Or our idea. That we, there's nothing that's, a, a, there's no objective that is written in laws of nature that man should have these qualities. In fact, the idea that you would change human nature by creating a legislative process or set of regulations is to me rather frightening. Especially if the instrument of doing that is based upon force, that is the state. The state is force. And nor is it omniscient, nor is the, the social engineers. No, they don't have the relevant knowledge to know about what our lives should be, according to our own interpretations. But they are allowed to make those decisions in spite of their inability to be able to understand what people actually want. Under the central planning, what was the least important component of society under central planning? The consumer, which is everybody. You say, well, we don't have enough. Too bad it's the plan. It's not what we want. Too bad it's the plan. I want to do a different job. You can't. It's not in the plan. Where's the human element? Social engineering? Social repression. So, we need to be alert to the possibilities of, in every instance of our life, of the expansion of these ideas about social engineering. So, what I see, and I, I wrote some papers about this back in the early 90s. When, when I grew up as a student and as a young professor, I had such a good time debating Marxists. It was easy. The thing is, I read what they read. They didn't read what I read, so they were disarmed. And so I was always optimistic that we could defeat them. Not only in argument, but in life. That we would prevail. That is, we humans, not we people that think like me, but all of us would discover that these kinds of arrangements were inhuman. Inhumane. And they would end. And they did. But now we've got a different set of problems. And I began thinking about this as I saw the Berlin Wall fall and all of that. Has anybody ever... There's, there's an American uh, game that's called Whack a Mole. A mole is a little, little uh, creature that comes up out of the ground. And th in this game, you wait for one of these to pop up and then you hit it. And it pops up over here, and then you hit it, and it... Well, this is what's going on now. The same people who promoted social engineering and state control have reinvented themselves. Some people talk about cultural Marxism, where instead of class struggle, where we've got uh, the, the, the proletariat being exploited by the uh, capitalist class, now everybody can be a victim. And the... How you resolve that victim, the, the victimization, before it was uh, the exploitation of workers, so you privatize, sorry, sorry, you nationalize uh, the private property, eliminate private property. Now, it's all over the map. 
Environmentalism, or what I call ecologism, becomes a new way for the state to take control. And based upon something that, and you know, I was walking around today and there's school children marching around with signs saying, don't pollute my life. Now, I don't know why they weren't in school learning mathematics or culture or other things, but this has become a new religion. A bishop in a Catholic church in Germany was remarking about a young schoolgirl who encouraged children to stay out of school on a Friday. She said, she is like Jesus Christ. So, so you know, I, I find this really remarkable. Here's a guy who's a holy man, and he's telling people, oh, you don't need to come to my church. You've got another one. You just go to a meeting. And there's your salvation. Jesus is in this girl. Don't come to... I mean, it's idiotic. The fact that the Pope didn't throw the guy out immediately is insane. He's telling people he doesn't need to come to his church. So, this is what we're facing now. This is that whack-a-mole problem. And it's popping up here. I'm going to address this one. There are many other ones. But this, the one I'm thinking about here is state regulation of the environment. So, there was an expression that developed about the same time, and you probably have heard it, where this is watermelon economics. It's green on the outside, the environment, and it's red on the inside. That is promoting social engineering, promoting state regulation. So it's red in the communist sense. And this is what I fear. So we're selling to these school children. We're brainwashing these school children. This is a form of social engineering that to me is very dangerous. Because at what point will they start turning in their parents? Ah, she's not recycling. My mother is a bad person. She doesn't do what my teacher tells me is the right thing. Remember, these were stories we heard in the Soviet times where the children would tell the authorities about the misbehavior of their parents based upon the brainwashing in the school. So this is... So, a lot is going on under the name of science. But as I told you, I, at least my interpretation, science is fluid. To talk about a scientific consensus is something unbelievable. Now, what responsible science, scientist would even, unless he has an interest in something else? But for me to say, the science says this, and you, you have no right to deny it. And if you deny it, you should be punished. Or we take away your privileges, or we don't support you. Uh, again, this is part of this social engineering process. It's part of this propaganda. And it's, I think, quite dangerous. So, what we know, if we look back, Hitler was trying to sell people, you know, the individual is less important than the whole. That's how you can decide to have genocide. Genocide is a good thing because it makes the whole better. You get rid of gypsies, Jews, homosexuals, disabled people, and look at how good society will be. Gee, I mean, you have to be German to believe that, apparently. Well, some of my family were, but they weren't involved in that. We've been in America for a long time. But, um, so, and that, of course, communism was about that. It's for the good of the community. It's for the, so, in order to protect or to do, you have to sacrifice for the whole. So the individual becomes a servant to society. Well, that's a form of slavery. In other words, you don't have human free will. You don't have human agency. You're assigned to do what you must do. So, uh, what we see today too, there's something called the precautionary principle. Has anybody heard of precautionary principle? It's an idea that, well... The risk of, say, if we think about climate change, 
is so high, that the outcome is so high, that if we get to a tipping point where uh, climate goes out of control because we've got too many carbon emissions, then in order to avoid that, we have to act now. And of course, they said, if we don't act now in 2010, climate will hit a turning point, tipping point. Well, if we don't do it by 2015, we're going to hit the tipping. Oh, we didn't hit it yet, but uh, 2020. They keep moving it around. So it's a very fluid concept. Science is fixed, but all these other projections are fluid. If they don't work, they change them. Now, so the precautionary principle actually privileges an unknown future generation so that we're trying to preserve for them what we have today and maybe more without understanding or valuing what the trade-off is if we take these actions today. Has anyone heard of Bjorn Lomborg? He is a Danish environmentalist. He came up with some estimates. If all of these agreements in the Paris Protocol, which was a climate uh, treaty, if all of these were implemented today, the costs, which are in the trillions of dollars, would delay the projections of the global warming effects by like less than an hour in the year 2100. In other words, there's an enormous upfront cost for an uncertain, very distant benefit in the future that's tiny. But people are buying into this argument. Because they buy into this, they over-exaggerate this sense of precaution. Now, Nassim Taleb, who was a very famous uh, uh, investment guy, he's a big guru, brilliant guy, I like most of what he does, but he's kind of given into this argument, which kind of surprises me. But um, this ignores costs and benefits. So, now markets are another way. Now, we don't think about markets as a regulatory process, but they are. Now, if we think about corporate behavior, the most important aspect of market-oriented regulation is what we would call brand identity or brand integrity. Now, let's see. What, I don't know if I have anything that's branded. I'm too poor. Um, ah, this is uh, Uniqlo. Do you, know, you don't know. Yeah, okay, Nike. Nike doesn't own any production facilities. Nike only owns a trademark. That's it. Well, they have a few buildings and maybe some cars. Or, yeah. But what they own is that trademark. If they do something that people believe is wrong, either socially or economically, or if they have an inferior product, they lose value in their brand. They will do whatever they have to do to maintain that brand integrity. This is a very strong regulating device. So when Nike was found to have hired, because they don't own factories, they would pay a Vietnamese factory owner to produce Nike products. They found out that the guy was mistreating his workers according to some standards. So Nike ended the contract like that and had to go and look around and make sure that nobody violates those community standards anymore. That's a very strong self-regulating mechanism. But I'll talk about some, some different ones. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that there are tradable rights. Fish live in schools, we call them. That is, they move together. And they're born in the school, they stay pretty much in school. So you could put an electronic tag on some of those fish and identify where that school of fish is and sell it to her. And so she would set up on her phone an app that would show where her fish are and if anybody was taking them. And if they are taking them, either she would hire someone or ask the state, which might have some instruments, to, like a coastal guard or something, to go and protect her property, just like you would protect your private property. And you could sell these rights as a way of limiting how many fish are taken. Just like you limit how many people eat your cows. 
You know, if people just come to your land and eat all your cows, you don't have any cows left. The same with fish. If you don't have ownership over them, they tend to be depleted. So this is one. Now, New Zealand has done this. Iceland experimented with this. So this is a new idea. Well, it's not so new. It's been around for a while. It's a way of solving an environmental problem. But what, the way that you do it, property rights. You assign property rights to it, and people will protect the property. They conserve it. They have a reason to conserve it. The extinction of endangered species, like a rhinoceros, because the crazy Chinese think that, never mind, whatever they do with a rhino horn, uh, they, they go out and kill these rhinos because nobody owns them. But the rhinos that live on private game farms have babies all the time. Because the guy that owns that rhinoceros will shoot you if you try to kill his rhino. He protects his private property. So private property is the solution for a lot of these problems. So carbon credits, well, these haven't worked so well, but it's an idea. It's a way of giving people the right to emit certain amounts of carbon-based emissions. And whoever has the highest cost of those reductions will buy the right from someone who has a low cost of those emissions. So they trade them. So you can continue producing a high, uh, higher amount of, of carbon emissions through this trading process. So this are the kinds of things that can be done. Pollution charges like taxes on pollution emissions, these could be implemented. Of course, in all of these, the problem is it depends upon a third party, usually the state, usually a technocrat, bureaucrat, or politician, to decide on what's the appropriate level. And that's on, in itself problematic for the reasons I've already mentioned. Now, the, the best way is profit-driven innovations. Now, the United States, of all the industrialized economies, has reduced its carbon emissions the most. Why? Because some crazy guys that were, uh, and, and these, were, these were small producers, these weren't the big oil companies, but what we call wildcatters, these, these uh, private uh, explorers for mineral resources. They developed this new technology called hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling with on, on, with a very small amount of money. And in doing that, they created an unexpected uh, bonanza of natural gas, which is the lowest polluting carbon fuel. And so all of a sudden, the gringos are using natural gas to heat and to create electricity or whatever instead of coal. And you, but you know where the coal went? The crazy Germans shut down all their nuclear power because it was somehow a problem. And they were worried about environmental issues. They're burning America's coal that we gave up. But the good news is it's high quality coal. And it's cheaper now because we don't, we don't need it. So they can have it. But they're polluting more than they were before with nuclear power. And at a higher cost. Now that's a great idea, right? Well, anyway, well the Germans are rich, so they can afford it. They can do stupid things. But it shows you what happens. You get fixated on these ideas and you make the wrong decision. Europeans refuse to allow hydraulic fracturing. And the reason is, and again, this is private property. The reason it worked in America is because if you own land, you own what is beneath it. I don't have to ask the government to dig a well, or to drill a well, or to take it out. But in virtually every other country in the world, if you want to extract minerals or carbon fuel, you have to have permission from the state. It's a restriction on private property. The state owns what's beneath the soil. Why? Look what happened in America. We, as I say, if you believe in, and love the environment, what happened in the U.S. is a good thing. Because natural gas is a much cleaner fuel than petroleum or coal. So, this is 
a huge thing. So we, it's shale oil. It comes out of the shale. So, um, now, let's look at some voluntary environmental programs. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of businesses that some of them are industrial. That is, the industry gets together and they develop a strategy. How can we, how can we make our industry more attractive to the population? And what can we do to create a better image? So they have an incentive. Not only individually to protect their brand, but the industry as a whole needs to clean up its image. So they tend to do these things. Uh, when there's less bureaucracy, as I say in the case of most European countries, you have to beg and ask and plead with the bureaucrats and the politicians to take oil out of the ground or whatever else. So every country in the world, I'm sure even Georgia, probably has shale oil. But you, you're not getting it because the state owns it. You can't go and look for it. And, well, you can go look for it, but you can't extract it without permission. So every country, Israel, this tiny little country, they have enough offshore natural gas to power the whole Middle East. Who knew? It took this innovation to discover it. And it's where there's less regulation that we have these kind of innovations. Now, corporate environmentalism, I'm a little bit suspicious of this, but what we do know is that a lot of people will pay a premium for green products, organic food. I, you know, I've been looking it up. I, I know how to use Google. I've been trying to find out how organic food operates at the cellular level, which is where it matters in my body, differently than non-organic food or genetically modified oil. at the cellular level maybe taste okay taste I'm all over it if organic food but I have an allergy to high prices I don't pay those high prices unless there's something to it other than someone says it's this or that okay now a personal thing that's just the way I live in the in life. Because I don't see the scientific evidence. Because again, scientific evidence is like economics. You know, economists say that you should do this. The others say you should do that. Okay? It's just an argument. It's just a debate. It's not a, there's no objective reality behind it. So, self-regulation, voluntary codes, and so on. Has anybody ever been scuba diving? You know, the underwater? Who, who regulates that industry? The state? Padi, P A D I. This is a dangerous activity, right? You've got to go below, you know, you're maybe 30 meters below the sea, and you're d relying upon. Huh, you learn from a certified individual who is certified by a private organization. That private organization oversees the, the way the tanks are built and so on. I mean, there are lots of aspects of our lives that are privately regulated we don't even think about or know about. We just assume that government is what makes us safe. In many instances, NASCAR? Oh, never mind. That's a private organization. They regulate the races and so on. So there's lots of... Uh, if you turn over this computer, you'll find under this computer a UL logo. Now, this stands for Underwriters Laboratory. This organization inspects billions of products every year to certify that they won't blow up when you turn them on unless it's a Samsung Note 2 whoops well it happens but these guys who are certifying every electric or electronic industry that's manufactured and sold they do it with 9,000 employees 9,000 employees worldwide now, how many people work in the ministry of something or other here that are supposed to be regulating something or other? You suspect it's more than 9,000 just for Georgia? Maybe just for the municipality of Tbilisi? So, I mean, this is something in everybody's life. It's in your pocket. I'm wearing it. Right? 9,000 people. This is self-regulation and... and in every aspect of life. So, where are the incentives for voluntary regulation? Well, to cut costs. 
I mean, this is a very strong motive for producers to try to find a way to reduce costs. And one of those ways of reducing costs is to reduce the amount of inputs that you utilize, which means that you're using less, fewer things from nature. So this has environmental consequences. Again, the green consumers, you know, the, there's something called Whole Foods in America. It's a, it's a supermarket chain that sells very expensive organic primarily products and they call it as a joke whole paycheck in other words if you go in there you're gonna spend everything you make because it's so expensive but people do it because they somehow they've been brainwashed or maybe they found on Google where it affects the cellular level but I have it and it, I'll ask uh, maybe I'll go and interview some people and find out what, how they know but um, so this inspires people to do these things, even if they have no consequence, as long as you believe. So it's value created. That's what economic trade is about. I have to offer you something that creates value in your mind or in your mouth or in your life. And that is the secret of trade-based capitalism. And some of it is to avoid government regulation because government regulation is rigid it's hard to get rid of it involves force it restricts freedom and so on so industries have a strong interest to do things that will avoid legislative impositions on them so these are fairly strong incentives now uh, what happens, as I mentioned earlier, if we focus only on the natural environment and we don't think about the human environment, then we're going to be much less free. Okay, let's think about it. Politics is about two things. More power for me, the government. More resources for me, the government. Right? Because in order for me to do what is good for you, you have to give me more power. But that means you have less freedom. For me to do what is good for you, I have to have more resources. Raise your taxes. Less for you. It's a zero-sum game. They win, we lose. We have to be constantly on guard against that possibility. Because it will be wrapped up in a Christmas present for you. Ah, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to punish her to protect you. But in the end, if we're not vigilant, if we're not alert, you know the experiment in biology where they put a frog in water or an animal in the water and you turn up the heat slowly and slowly and slowly. They'll boil to death. If you put them in the hot water, they would jump out. But if you bring the water up slowly, they'll boil to death. They won't notice that they're being cooked. Well, that's a little bit like what politics is. Little by little, more and more power to the state, less and less power of, and choice to the individual, limits on private property. All of a sudden, we're a boiled frog. We didn't even know it happened. We find ourselves in a state of an absence of human liberty or one that's so constrained that your life becomes less worth living. And this is what we're seeing. There's an intolerance. It may not be like that here, but although I would imagine if I could speak Georgian and I confronted those school children, they would have tried to beat me up. You know, well, they would hit me with the sticks maybe. I don't know. But I... They would say, no, you're wrong. My teacher, a respected authority figure, has told me to be intolerant about private property and individual choice. You're, lead, you're an evil person because you're creating too many carbon emissions. And you should be punished. It'll get to that point if we're not careful. Uh, Eco-terrorism. I don't know if you've heard about that, but there are groups in America in particular, I haven't heard about them in the rest of the world, 
that would go into these forests where people are cutting trees and put iron rods in so that when they came with these saws, the saws would break and sometimes injure or kill the guy. They said, well, they deserve it. If they're going to kill that tree, they deserve to die or to be injured. And it'll teach the rest of them. So there's lots of these kind of activities. So we see sometimes uh, they, were, uh, they would set bombs in uh, sort of uh, research and development centers for certain corporations because they believed that that corporation was evil. So they used terroristic tactics to punish them. Uh, you probably never heard of the Unabomber or Ted Kaczynski. There was a guy in America, it's been like 30 years back, that was sending mail bombs. And he was driven by the fact that capitalism was destroying the world and we need to punish the people who are assisting it. So he killed a couple of uh, university professors and some researchers and so on by sending them mail bombs. And he justified it based upon his ideas about the environment. He had a very long and complicated, and I mean, he was something of a crazy genius. He was very smart, but he was all messed up um, psychologically. Obviously, to kill people using bombs to further his own cause. So, and one of the funny things about this, it turns out that economists discovered that it's only when a country's per capita income gets to about four and maybe now $5,000 a year per capita income. It's only at that point that you begin to worry about the environment. Because if you're starving, you'll chop down the last tree. You'll kill the last antelope to feed yourself. But if you become rich, you say, ah, one of the many things that's good about life is to have a nice garden, to have clean air, and you can afford to do something about it. But if you keep people poor, like in the former Soviet Union or Red China, they didn't care about the environment. Why? They didn't know what it was. They never saw a clean environment. They never knew that this is something that... And anyway, even if they aspired to it, they were powerless because of the state repressing them and controlling them. So it's important that we have economic growth to improve living conditions. So, there may be a moment, like in China, China's increase, if, if America stopped producing any carbon-based emissions today, went to zero, became Stone Age, it wouldn't slow down the rate of expansion of the, the air pollution coming out of China and India. The globe wouldn't even notice it. And America's the biggest economy in the world. But there's so many others that have not reached that level of standard of living to be able to use the resources to solve the problems. I mean, of course, China's much better than it was when I went there in the 1980s. Much better. But they're still, because of the expansion of industrial production, creating lots of problems with air pollution and water pollution. So, the other thing... What we have, if, if we speak with one voice, driven by authoritarian impulses, like these poor school children. I mean, and then, of course, they were out of school, so every school child on a day like today is happy, but this is propaganda. I'm sorry. Even if you love the environment, I love the environment. I, I, there's nothing better for me. I, most of my, half of the year, I'm running in jungle trails in Asia. I love the environment. I love the, 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 the jungle, the forest. I mean, my life would be much worse without all of that. But I use rationality to engage the real world. You've got to be alert to how people's ideas about the natural environment are relative to the human environment. Now, Incentives are important. Economists, the main thing that economists teach us, I believe, is the importance of incentives. So incentives are the rewards and punishments for certain behaviors, the payoffs and the penalties, like that. Now, in terms of the private action, if there's no claim to the future value, so let's say that an asset, a forest, a rainforest, 
is not owned by anyone, it's owned by the state. The state actors have a strong incentive to utilize those resources because if they don't, somebody else might in the future and they will have missed an opportunity. So this happened in Thailand. The Thai military was overseeing this large area of land in the north of Thailand which was full of rainforest. So the generals started building roads in there so they could ship the, the rainforest to Japan. And they became rich. Thailand lost its rainforest not because of private property, but, but the absence of private property. Because the generals knew that if when they retired, the next guy would do it. They would have missed an opportunity to be rich. And who's going to... It's very difficult to resist that. Some did probably. But in general, you're going to find that people will give in to that incentive. Uh, so what we find then is what is sometimes called a tragedy of the commons. That it's just used up. Because nobody, no single uh, person has a strong enough incentive to protect those resources. Uh, private ownership encourages people to conserve things. Because you want your children to have them. You don't use, if you own a forest, you don't chop it all down today. If you do, your kids won't get any of it. It's gone. If I own the rainforest, I make you pay to come and see it. I use, I chop down some of it to, to pay for the, the echo lodge for crazy green people to come and stay in for $500 a day. Right? I have a strong incentive to maintain that and to keep its value over a long period of time. And capitalism, through this innovative process, creates incentives for people to innovate. And the rewards that come from it. The profits. So, state, well, where are the incentives? Whoops. Well, government officials tend to overregulate because they don't, they impose the costs on you. You say, well, look, if I accept these regulations, I have to close my business. Okay, it's the rule. They don't care. No, but I have to fire all my workers. Well, it's the rule. Well, can't we change the rules to talk to the legislators? This is life. This is reality. Because the regulators don't pay the price. They impose it on somebody else. They tend to overregulate. They're insensitive to the cost of regulation. And as I've warned you, and I think this is what's happening today, Political leaders are using the environment as a way to grab more resources, to grab more power. And they do, and some of them may deeply believe in all of this, but even if they do, the outcome is the same. Less freedom for us, more power for them. Less resources for us, more for them. So whether or not it's for good reasons or bad reasons, the end result is going to be the same. Now, what about climate change? A couple of years ago, I was invited to Bhutan. You ever heard of the kingdom of Bhutan in Asia? It's one of these funny little tiny places. Uh, it's got uh, maybe a couple million people. Uh, they get a lot of money from the... 40% of the government budget comes from either NGOs or from the World Bank or somebody else. So, all these guys were trying to impose their will on the kingdom of Bhutan. Some of my friends there invited me there to debate some uh, people from the World Bank about the environment. So my biggest point on this is that, you know, look, the climate's always changing. I mean, it's like I change my shoes every day. The climate's going to change, whatever we do. It's going to get better, it's going to get worse. That's a given. But I said, you know, look, uh, my opponent in the debate was hooked up by satellite and all to somebody in Bangkok to support her. Another guy was in Cape Town. Another guy was in Tokyo. So she had all these people to help her with her arguments. And here I am. I showed up. I was in this beat up old taxi. Came in with my laptop. She arrived in a brand new land cruiser with a chauffeur. Now who has a vested interest in climate change? 
If she's wrong, look at all those people that lose their jobs. I'm wrong and I'm just some stupid professor that's hanging around and likes to go to Bhutan. It should be clear. It was clear to me. and it, I made it clear to the audience that that's what was going on. I said, okay, who wins? This is what we're up against. And these people have a strong... Follow the money. Do you think... What government would ask me to develop an environmental policy for them? I always say, well, look, you have to be very careful. Cost-benefit analysis, you know, a limit on government expansion. These other guys are going, more money for the World Bank, you know, more money for you. Who are they going to hire? I mean, we're both scientists. I'm an economist, Ph.D., they never hire me. Follow the money. Government and political leaders hire people that give them the intellectual cover story to do what they want to do. Keynesianism, if you study economics, is all about expanding government. They all are Keynesians. They never hire a guy like me to give them economic policy advice. I'm a headache. So, anyway... Climate is really problematic. It, I mean, to, to say that the science is settled is a... I, I know all the 97% nonsense. You know, it, all these things are follow-the-money problems. Because there's so many people that are going to benefit in getting this message through that uh, these climate models are so complicated that you're going to be able to tell me that you can predict the climate in a hundred years when the weather forecast told me last week when I was in, I forget where I was, uh, Moldova, that it was going to be raining today all day. Uh, but these guys ha know with scientific certainty that the carbon emissions in a hundred years are going to... Who believes that? Why do we believe that? Well, because nobody challenges it. It's a consensus. If you challenge it, you're a heretic. We burn you at the stake. We take you out. We silence you. We do what we have to do. Okay. Now, uh, now these people who they say they believe in science, but many of the same people are against genetically modified foods, which are developed through scientific techniques, which have been certified by, you know, simply by use. We've been genetically modifying everything we consume since the beginning of time. But they say, that's wrong. But our science is right. Your science is wrong. Or the um, nuclear power. They're opposed to that. They say, but, you know, nuclear power has caused fewer deaths than, than solar power. I mean, despite the, the terrible disasters of Cher Chernobyl, but... It was, the, the scale, the human scale of that was very small. Or Takashima in, in uh, Japan. I mean, these things were, and it was almost all of the, the deaths were caused by people who were directly and immediately exposed after the incidents. Not the sort of collateral effects. So, anyway, these guys are crazy. The monopoly of ideology. And science. Science and ideology is a poisonous cocktail. It's one you never want to drink. It's worse than uh, Red Bull and vodka. Dangerous stuff. So, it's a rejection of the idea of discovery. To try to impose this idea. Only a politician or somebody that's politically motivated would ever say that science is settled. <laughs> Who says that? Well, they all do. They repeat it. It goes back into the media. And then we, the school teachers who are sometimes influenced by that, they're not bad people, but they go in with a propaganda and they, they take the school children out of school and march in the streets of Tbilisi. No. Now, follow the money. It's the whole, for me, it's not the whole story. I'm no more, no less motivated by love for the environment than these people are. And for them to claim that I'm, you know, 
encouraging destruction of the environment that I live in, that I'm ignorant of the consequences, it's an insult. But it's also more than an insult. It's a danger because it poses great risk to us. Now, one way, changing land use would, would have a much bigger impact on the perpetuation of species than climate change. And this is what we've seen over time. You know, when we started chopping down trees and, you know, clearing land for, 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 for agriculture, this had a huge impact on climate. But how do we... You know, well, of course, be careful because a lot of people want to reverse that. Don't eat meat. Those cows are making a lot of methane. Or, you, know, you, you know, it's we're being demonized because we enjoy certain things. These have become part of this sort of propaganda. So, um, I think I've probably spoken enough. Um, I've got a few more things to say, but. I think it would be better now to, to open up for questions or, or comments, if you have any. Thank you very much. Uh, let me get to the end of this. Any questions? Um, that's actually one of the struggles that I face myself because uh, I'm a libertarian and yeah. I'm against um, any sort of regulations that are imposed on uh, us by the government. But I also love the environment. So mm -hmm. for me, it's a concept of a uh, struggle of what is the best way. If you love the environment, what is the best way and how should you promote this love for the environment amongst other people? And... Um, is there anything that can be done, or is it just do your own part, little part for yourself, and uh, kind of don't intervene? You know, I, th I think it's, I mean, everyone chooses to live their own life. If you want to expend your own resources, recycling, and I mean, if, if, if one feels good about doing those things, I, obviously I, have, I might ridicule it for one reason or another, because what we found is that all the recycling programs that have occurred are a waste of money. That is, in fact, over time they wound up, they had so much recyclable material, they had to just bury it with everything else. Um, so, and the other thing is that, that shifts the supply curve to the right, which drives the price down, the value of it, so that the value of recycling, recyclable materials tends to decline over time. So success leads to failure in a sense. But so I think you should do those things. I, the only, the real, and, and it, it's, almost as, it's almost as challenging. Individual actions to halt environmental degradation is as challenging as individual action to stop the expansion of the state. Because you just have one vote. And you only have one vote every two years, five years, whatever. Or you have a voice to try to convince people that they should resist the expansion of the state. Because I believe, as I say, the regulatory state, the redistributive state, is a zero-sum game that makes human liberty less. And in doing that, the answer to your question, will I live in a better place in the future, has to do with how and what happens to the scope of human liberty. And I think, that, and so this is what I fight. I can't fight, um, well, I could, I mean, I could feel good about doing, a lot of the gestures that we make in the environment, I, I buy an electric car, okay, and I impose high costs on myself, which, you know, are, would be much, you know, almost all the electric car technology is non-economic without government subsidies. So in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a, either a diversion of resources or a waste of resources. But if you feel good about it and if you convince yourself that it makes the environment better, but it doesn't. Because in electric cars actually have a very long pipeline to an electric power plant. But you ignore that. 
That power plant to power your electric car, this, it's not, the car's not creating emissions, the power plant is. So you can pretend like, oh, I didn't do that. But you did. You got it from there. And it's creating air pollutants. So it's, but if, you know, these aren't going to solve our problems. What solved the carbon emission problem in America was shale oil. Hydraulic fracturing. Something that was never imagined 10 years ago. It had the most significant impact on improving the environment of any invention in a long history. But as I said, governments are not allowing it to be implemented. Why? I mean, if they care about the environment, that is a win that you shift from oil to natural gas is a big win. But they won't allow it. The reason is they're, they're locked in to zero carbon emissions. So even if you come up, it's not good enough to use a better <laughs> source today because it's carbon based. You say, but, but it's going to improve the environment. We want to get rid of all of them. This is unbelievable. Rejecting uh, the, 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 the improvement in, in search of the perfect. I mean, it, it's really hard for me to believe that, that this is how governments operate. In America, we use ethanol to dilute petroleum substances in the cars. But it's very destructive to internal combustion machines to mix ethanol with petrol. But they do it not for the environment, but because the big agro-industrial industries are, are donating money to the legislators to keep this stupid policy in place. And the Greens are so stupid, they think it's a good idea. They don't realize that it's making, uh, it's a lobbying outcome. That's really not making any big difference to the overall environment. But it's less carbon-based fuel. But it's more costly. You have to chop down more trees to grow the corn to have the ethanol. Because they won't let the ethanol come from, from Brazil, where it's cheaper coming from sugarcane, because of protectionism. If they cared about the environment, they'd get rid of the protectionism, let this stuff come in from Brazil. They're not going to do it. So why do you believe that the government is capable of making the right choices to make the environment better? They don't. They won't. They can't. The incentives are not there. The best thing we can do is allow profit-based innovation in search of these things. Now, it is probably the case that we've made improvements in solar technology and wind technology that might not have occurred without some subsidies. But if those were profitable enough, you would need the subsidies. The time is not ready yet for those things. And of course, as I say, given the fluidity of the, the drop dead point, of the tipping point, tells me that we're in no big hurry to make radical changes in how we get energy. Oh, sorry. Maybe give it to me. I move faster than you. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking about practical solutions, you know, because the key, uh, well, the key difficulty probably is monetizing externalities, right? Hmm. Like negative externalities mm -hmm. in case of yeah. carbon fuels and positive externalities, for example, in case of forest, right? Mm -hmm. There are thousands of mountains in Georgia, mm -hmm. but uh, you know nobody would be able to monetize on mm -hmm. those because mm -hmm. they they create air. Well, we don't Everybody know. I mean, it, air. if you if you cannot go beneath the earth in Georgia to extract things because the state won't allow you, I, I'm sure that's the case in Georgia. There's no subsoil mineral rights in the private hands, right? Almost certain. So we don't know. There, there may be stuff under there 
that if, you know, he's, he's studying engineering, he's studying geology, they're having drinks together and some King Kali, and, and he says, oh, you know what? And then they find rare earths. Because, oh, I, you know, I heard, I read this. And I, when I was up there, I saw that. And, but it, no, it's not going to happen. You say, well, if, what's the point of talking about it? They won't let us go for it. So I, these are the ways we get advancements. That is through private actions. Governments are not often the inspiration for human advancement. It's an individual choice. You know, we're, I mean, of course there are conditions where if there's no other possibilities, like in the Soviet Union, they were able, through a reward system, it wasn't available to other people to get scientists to come up with new ideas, the Kalashnikov, you know, these great peaceful tools and so on. Uh, so, I mean, there would be creativity in that. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of people who are just naturally creative, even with the, in these repressive systems. And if the right person gets into the right circumstance, you get something. But in a system of private property that where you've got profit-driven motivations, you're going to have all over the place. Of course, you get rap music and you get a lot of crap. But you get cultural change. You get economic innovation. You get technical innovation that will not necessarily emerge in the same way, if at all, when there's so much state control. And that's the primary argument that I'm making. Externalities. Externalities exist because all of them because of the absence of property rights or the inability of the state to enforce them. And that's not a market failure. That's a government failure. Right? It's not, I mean, markets work if you have private property. But externality, you say, well, okay, externalities exist. Well, and I say, okay, why didn't the state secure private property? Did we get rid of the externalities? We trade them. So, you know, noise pollution. You know, I... I have the right to quiet, and you want to make noise, you have to negotiate with me. So I allow a certain amount of noise, and you get to do what you want to do. But we negotiate. You get the right to make noise, I want quiet, I negotiate with you. doesn't matter. The outcome will be more or less the same. We'll have the same level of noise and quiet. But human beings decide what the right level is, instead of the state. We can eliminate all... You know, I used to teach this nonsense, you know, about externalities. And, and it used to be, oh, this is a role for the state. The state will go in and they'll fix it. No, they don't. The way to solve it is through private property rights. And define them, allow them to be traded, and then enforce them. That's the role. I mean, if you're a minarchist, a classical liberal, you say, well, that's the role of the state. Enforcement and justice and courts and that sort of thing. Solve externality, no problem. Well, problem, but it's, it's solvable without the state. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, it was very interesting. So I have one question, actually two questions. So the first question is um, about your notion of uh, environment, nature and environment versus human environment, mm -hmm. as far as I understand. And uh, I, I want to... Uh, uh, make you to elaborate more about this because uh, recently uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, mm -hmm. which you uh, probably know very well, uh, she said that, uh, uh, who is also the author of the new Green Deal or whatever it's called, uh, she also said during one podcast that uh, she advised people to have less babies in order to prevent the environment, because she said that people are making this, uh, destroying the environment, and the less people we have, it's better. So, and I think it uh, illustrates very well the mindset of uh, these people, because uh, uh, they have some uh, inherent hatred for, the, for ordinary people, I guess, mm -hmm. for humanity. And, uh, uh, in order to explain this uh, mm. 
Again, I think whatever you are saying is completely right, like uh, they want to this central planning and uh, mm -hmm. to uh, make this uh, like communistic, uh, um, I don't know, society uh, in order somehow to protect uh, the environmental us from environmental destruction okay. and so on. And, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, hazard for, uh, for people, for humanity, is the central part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm, uh, how to say it, uh, what, what, what do you think about uh, uh, how can we fight against this? Because mm. again, if, if we go to, back to your notion, more humans we have, the more nature will change. Mm -hmm. And I do not think it's a very bad thing. I don't, okay, so nature will change and it doesn't, okay, somehow someone will say it's destroyed in this process. Mm -hmm. It is not the same as like virgin, uh, I don't know, virgin um, uh, wild and so on. Mm -hmm. okay. But so what? Yeah. It's better for humans. Okay. And another question is that, um, uh, another question was, um, uh, do you know Matt Ridley, who is the British writer? And uh, he's, uh, he had the lecture, and during this lecture about the, about the um, climate change or global warming, it was called global warming in the past, I guess. Now it's called climate change. So he said that uh, um, we are worrying too much about it. Because even if it is truly happening, mm -hmm. even if humans are somehow at least uh, um, partially responsible for that, so again, so what? Mm -hmm. uh, he is saying that we are creating some arguments, some too much fuss about it. Because, okay, so environment is getting warmer. Mm -hmm. That means that deserts are be, uh, getting uh, greener. Mm -hmm. And like uh, uh, parts of the uh, uh, earth uh, which were like covered by yeah. ice now are yeah. covered by uh, earth. Mm -hmm. And it's better for, yeah. for, for humans. Yeah. It, it may uh, cause like uh, some change again, some parts of the, uh, s some cities may become like uh, covered by water, but it yeah. will open other opportunities. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is my questions, thank you. So the very quickly, first one. Uh, more people die from cold every year than from heat. Yeah. Thousands of more people die from where it's too cold than where it's too hot. That is related to the temperature. So cold is much more dangerous to life, whether human or otherwise, than, than warming. It is true that in areas of the world where you have greenery, there's more of it. In places where there was no greenery, there's some of it. So, in a way, when, when I was a kid, I had something that was called a terrarium. So, in that, I had this big glass jar, and I put soil and plant life in it, and then I put some water in there, and I sealed it. And the, the heat would make the water vapor rise, and it would collect on this plastic, and it would rain, rain on it. And this terrarium kind of kept going for a long, long, long time. Well, the earth is a little bit like that. So if it gets warmer, we, we get water vapor. And water vapor is the main component of the atmosphere. And it's the one component in, that is not in the climate models. It's the most significant greenhouse gas. But they cannot model it because it's too dynamic. So they completely ignore the most single important component of climate change, water vapor. Because this is what will make it rain when it's hot and cool things off. And add water where it's needed so that we have green stuff that eats the carbon dioxide. And so with carbon dioxide levels going up, more green stuff reacts to it. <clears throat> so this is why he said it, it's not such a big deal. It doesn't, I mean, the Earth's been here for a long time and it's gone through all kinds of cycles. But it, it didn't spin out of control and go out into the outer galaxies. It has a natural equilibrating function, set of functions, that in absence of some catastrophic sort of black swan event like an asteroid, it's probably going to be relatively stable. 
The other thing, their first point, environmental sins, the sins of environmental action, are other people's problem. You did it. Your choices are the environmental sin. Hey, if we chop down all these stupid vineyards in, in Georgia, get rid of all this wine and plant trees there, it's your fault. We could do something different with that land. Of course, this is what happens. You know, people see your action as the problem, not theirs. And so this is what we're having now. We're, these the people are overlooking the impact of their own decisions and inventing problems where they're not. And the solution, hey, shut down this university. All you, these people came to the university today burning fuel. Let's go online. That'll be a much better way to solve environmental problems. Close all the universities and make all the professors teach online. So environmental sins are the actions of other people. And so we invent these ideas that we say, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't do that. I can find lots of ways to improve the environment. But in doing so, it would devalue your life. I mean, Georgia without wine? Jesus. It's unbelievable. But some people could make that argument. Georgia without grilled meat? You know? But that's a problem. So, I, we need to be, as I say, I mean, it's, I only have one story to tell tonight. We need to do what we can to convince people of the dangers of expanding the powers of the state using the environment as the issue. We need to think sensibly about the environment and not exaggerate the impact of, of silly things. You know, the, the, the founder of the Gaia movement, um, uh, Jeffrey, I think, Lovelock is his name. He said, the only solution, if you really want to fix things, with the climate, is we go to nuclear power. Well, they threw him out of the movement. He was the guy that founded it. Because they don't want to believe that. But if you think about it, despite the dangers of nuclear power, which are controllable, except in one or two very peculiar circumstances, uh, have not been all that dangerous. I mean, there's no nuclear power accident We've got nuclear power in America. France, I think they get 30% of their power from nuclear power. Germany had it until the idiots stopped it. I mean, some of the safest technology in the world. The Swedes did the same thing. The safest technology, the, the best track record, these two countries, and they closed them down, which meant that their carbon emissions went straight up. So, there are solutions that don't require state involvement. In fact, less state involvement in many ways is the best solution. So I leave it up to you. We all have to choose. Uh, one last question. Uh, thank you for your lecture. What do you think about uh, sustainability and sustainable development? I think sustainable development is also uh, a tactic to expand state power. The concept uh, has never been challenged by capitalism. I mean, the only way we're going to have a sustainable future is to be productive and to trade. Because it, it's the basis of wealth creation, which is the basis of improved standards of living. It's the basis of creating the possibilities to have a cleaner environment, to come up with new technologies like hydraulic fracturing that release us from that, that cycle of environmental degradation. China would still be heavily polluted if they hadn't embraced capitalism and trade and globalization. The Soviet Union countries would still be degrading their environment if they hadn't entered into these globalizing trade relations. So, 
if you want to have a sustainable future, secure private property, limit the restrictions on trade, promote human interactions to have creativity. That, to me, is a much simpler... Now, we could work out some other some details, but if we look at the United Nations plans, it's about expanding state power, having programs to do this, subsidies to do that. Though a subsidy for him is a tax on her. Win, lose. But trade is a positive sum game. He gets something he values more, she gets something she values more in the exchange. So I, I'm, I've written a little bit about sustainable development. I've looked at you know, the sustainable development goals and all that of the United Nations. And again, I have an allergy to those kind of proposals that would rely upon, again, either subsidies or regulations that are in the hands of a bureaucrat or a politician that's either motivated by ideology, political partisanship. Now, when we do it in democracy, this is an interesting thing. Georgia's become a more or less vibrant democracy. Lots of democratic uh, uh, changes of government, personalities. And all. Every representative democracy creates permanent rules on the basis of a majority that emerged at one moment in time and that did not exist ever before or after. People die, people change their mind, they don't vote, they do vote. But we elect a set of politicians that set into place regulations and legislation as though they have some objective, uh, universal wisdom. And most legislation and regulation is permanent. But the people that decided on it, they're gone in a few years. But we're living with the aftermath of that. Now, what created that majority could be ideological fashion. The belief that socialism will create a new man that will make us all better off. That comes and goes, right? So ideological fashions are, you know, when people have been influenced either by propaganda or dominance of some sort of thinking. Keynesian economics, this kind of crazy stuff, right? Now, or political partisanship. I'm a conservative and you're a radical. And, you know, so we have these majorities that are always moving around. But the outcome of that is this permanent set of rules that we're left with. I mean, legislators don't get into office and go, okay, guys, before we pass another piece of legislation, let's, let's go back and see what we need to get rid of. Right? They do that, right? No. They don't care. They don't think about that. Ah, what can we do now? We're gonna, you know, I, I'm going to create a subsidy for him, and she won't know I'm going to tax her. And this is how it's done. And, and he'll vote for me because I'm promising. This is the reality of politics and state control. Even in representative democracy. It's dangerous. Because once those things are in place, you're probably stuck with them. They're not going to go back and review it. Then Most of them, uh, AOC as she's referred to, I don't care much about American politics because I get no joy out of it. Um, but these politicians dream up these ideas. They have no knowledge of economics, have no understanding of the impact in terms of costs because they don't pay the costs. They just see how it benefits them. I win elections by coming up with a, a green plan or Medicaid for all or these kind of nonsense ideas. And if people don't stand up and say, have you even a, a beginning of an idea of how that will impact human liberty. <laughs> Why should I care? I'm going to be elected. And it doesn't really affect me because I have power. I'm, I'm in this public office. I have privileges that you don't have. I mean, it's just... So, sorry. I mean, I, I know I gave a one-sided perspective. But I think it's a perspective 
that is not often heard. And maybe in a format and maybe a structure that's not often heard. I know there are other sides of all of this. I know there are other interests in this. And I may have minimized certain positions. But it's partly out of frustration. Now, I've been fighting these fights for all my academic career. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to die soon, you know. And I, I don't see any good results. You know, I, because I really feel like people like this crazy congresswoman are really promising. I would almost say the end of civilization. If we end civilization on the back of sustainable development, that's a bad choice. If we end civilization on the back of environmental protection, that's a bad choice. I'm suggesting to you that those are potential outcomes of accepting those kinds of arguments. That you will find yourself like that frog in the water that's slowly coming to a boil and then there's nothing left. It's like the, the bishop in Germany. This woman, this girl, this schoolgirl is like Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's, the end of, that, that's the end of religion. I mean, you've got no argument for religion anymore. I, I'm not religious. I have no particular interest in... I would have thought this guy understood how to protect his own interests in promoting religion. But he killed it. And that people don't see that? That the Pope didn't call him up and say, Hey, get out of there. I want you out of that church in five minutes. Something wrong with the church. There's something wrong with the thinking. There's nothing wrong with the church, sorry. The thinking of the people of the church. The church is manifest. The church is perfect. The church... It's the people, like this crazy bishop. I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feel free to email me. Uh, be lovely to interact with you. Thank you. <laughs>